Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to bring you an episode on how to get into cybersecurity and what skills you'd need in that industry. We both get a lot of questions from people who are asking us about how to get into cybersecurity. And I think it's even more common these days because universities are starting to do degree granting programs, associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees in information security. And some of these people don't have experience in the industry and they're looking for their first job or they're trying to break into the industry, recent graduates, or even people who are switching from other career fields into cybersecurity because they are seeing that it is a growing field and people are needed for the, the industry. So we did an episode a few months back about how we got into cybersecurity And if you haven't heard that episode, I urge you to go back and listen to it because it's always interesting to hear about how other people got into the industry because I think it's not always a straight line like you graduate, you get a degree, and then you go right into cybersecurity, right? Sometimes you take a few detours along the way, but you bring those experiences into the field, and I think that is important. So go back and listen to it if you haven't. This particular episode, we're going to really focus on specifically the skills that you need for cybersecurity. I think the first thing that you need to understand before you say, I'm going to jump into this, is there's a lot of different subdomains in cybersecurity. So you need to understand all the different areas because you can't just say, I'm going into cybersecurity. It's the same thing as saying, I'm going to go into medicine, right? How many different type of doctors are there? There's a lot of different ones, and you have to figure out which one you're actually going to be. And it's the same thing for cybersecurity. The majority of cybersecurity professionals are probably what we call blue teamers because there are a lot of companies out there. Every company has analysts or security engineers or architects that are working for them that are trying to secure their companies, So those are considered blue teamers, and it's probably by far the most widely common job that is in the field. And that ranges from like incident response to forensics, which is also commonly associated with incident response, identity and access management, assigning permissions, creating identities, security engineering and architecture where you're putting in solutions, and application security, where you're coding different applications and then trying to secure those applications. Red teaming is also something that is in the industry. Probably the second most common subdomain in information security. That often entails like pen testing, ethical hacking, something that has come up a lot more recently and is becoming a career field in itself is bug bounty hunting. People sometimes do that on the side, but if you're good enough and you're able to see that type of vulnerabilities and different applications that you're using, I mean, you can absolutely make it a career. People are getting 10, 20, 50,000, $100,000. If you find a, vulnerability and you report it ethically through a company like Google or Facebook, they're paying a lot of money for these particular bounties. So definitely something that you can make it a career if that's what you're interested in and you're good at. And that is really nice because most of the time you're working on your own in your own office, you don't have to report to a boss. And so that that has a lot of freedom with it. Threat intelligence, a lot of my military intelligence friends This is something that they transition from the military into civilian world threat intelligence for cybersecurity because the skill set is very similar. And so that is a whole different career field where you're analyzing the entire threat landscape. Could be 
nation state actors. Microsoft actually has a really great um, department that actually reports to the legal side of Microsoft, and they hire people who are fluent in Korean and Russian and Arabic, and they specialize in the threat landscape of those countries in that area specifically for cyber. So if that is an interest, you can always pivot to cybersecurity from a threat background. Social engineering is another specialty. There are people who specialize in just social engineering and they're very, very good at it. They do open source intelligence. They're able to find all sorts of information on people and then they're able to communicate and convince people on giving up their information, right? Without actually quote unquote hacking them. They're essentially hacking the person rather than the system. Compliance is another area that overlaps with cybersecurity. Oftentimes there are lawyers who are focusing on different compliance or privacy laws that are out there like GDPR, HIPAA, PCI, and those things can drive cybersecurity initiatives. It's not directly related, but it's kind of like that Venn diagram where there are cybersecurity aspects of compliance. So a lot of lawyers will pivot. Like Chris Krebs, he has a JD, and he was the head of CISA. And then some other ones like malware analysis and engineering that's really specialized, right? Like if you're into code and like breaking down an, an executable, like that could be a calling for you, but those are extremely specialized. And then of course, don't want to forget about my friend Adam here in technical sales. That's also something very common these days. I think blue teaming and actually technical sales are probably the two largest uh, career fields in cybersecurity. There's a ton of, of companies out there who are hiring people who can speak technically to customers and be able to be an evangelist for their product, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is a, a big conversation when it comes to all of these different subdomains is the difference between a generalist and a specialist. And we talked about those blue teamers and the technical sales folks. And I think in those career fields, you want to be a generalist. You want to be able to know a little bit about everything because if you're specialized in something and you're going really deep, you're just not going to be as marketable in my opinion. You want to know a little bit about each one and be able to bounce between the different subdomains, make connections at your company in those different areas, people who work in those areas. And, you know, if you're able to make those connections and speak intelligently and be interested in that area, once you have those connections, you're going to get stuff done faster because you're going to know the people in your company that when you need something done, I need something done for networking. Oh, I know who to go to because I've already established that relationship with the network engineer because he knows that I know a little bit about network networking and I'm interested in networking. It's not my job, but I know enough to communicate with him on a technical level. So I think that that's important in my opinion. What do you think, Adam? It's a, it's an important balancing act where, especially early on in your career, you're going to want to generalize more. You don't want to jump into a specialty right away because you're still kind of building those connections. You're creating those synapses and it, it's, it's going to really help in your career development early on. As you kind of find out what you like and what you're really into, you can start to drill into that over time. But certainly there's a balancing act here. And, you know, they're both challenging. There's the bigger the company, the more specialized the roles are going to be. And there's benefits to that. The smaller the company or the smaller the organization, the more generalized the roles are going to be. And each has their pluses and minuses. Um, I, I sometimes think generalizing is harder overall because you are expected to know so much 
about so many things. And that's really, really hard, especially given the stressors of being in cybersecurity. So there's there's a balancing act there and you'll kind of figure it out. It'll it'll happen naturally in your career because early on you're just not going to have the specialization to go into those roles. So you will naturally fall into a, more of a generalist role and over time you will start to find what lights your fire and you'll go in that direction. So a lot is made of this, but ultimately it'll kind of figure itself out and that's that's helpful. I think back to when I came out of college, I actually didn't know the different components of even an IT organization. I couldn't have articulated to you what are the different parts of an IT shop at like a, a mid-sized enterprise, like here in the Des Moines, Iowa area. I didn't know. I knew, you know, there were people that made the Windows PCs go on people's desktops. I, I guess I knew there was a network team. But I didn't really understand a lot of the different roles like identity and access management or uh, security engineering, or I didn't know what an architect was. Like, There's so much you don't know at first. And so take your time and, and get that chance to learn those things. Because th the funny thing is, I don't think that's well documented, really. Like, What are the, the components of, of uh, an IT org? I don't know if that's really documented well somewhere because there might be some examples overall, but everyone's going to use different language and have slightly different layout. And it, it's something you just kind of have to learn through experience. So this, this is great what Andy has laid out already because it's so important to understand just what the different pieces are. You know, you start there and then you can kind of figure out what your roadmap looks like. Yeah, it's funny because my neighbor mentioned the other day, she was like, oh, my sister-in-law is hiring IT at her company. I told her you work in IT. So, you know, <laughs> if you're looking, there's going to be a job opening. And I was thinking in my head, like, well, what part of IT is the job hiring for, right? Because when people think IT, they mostly think help desk is probably what comes up, right? It's the guy mm -hmm. who helps solve the IT problems, right? The deeper knowledge and mm -hmm. the infrastructure and the servers, that probably doesn't come up. Same thing with cybersecurity. I think right. most of the time when, when you think cybersecurity, people think the incident response, like when there's something happening, or they think mm -hmm. the quote-unquote hacker, right? The pen tester. Mm -hmm. They think that that's cybersecurity. And there's just so the much person more. furiously banging on the keyboard, talking about how they're going to get that guy on the other end of the screen, kind of the, thing. The black hoodie, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it's yeah. there's a lot of stereotypes, and just you know, understanding the different aspects of cybersecurity and what he, Adam said, the different components of an enterprise IT organization, I think, is really important, especially when you're first starting out if you're trying to break into the industry. So we wanted to also kind of lay out because in my opinion, you can't ignore the basics. You have to have some level of basic technical knowledge to be in cybersecurity. Going to school for it and getting a certificate or a degree, I mean, that's a start, but you really have to be in the technology and understand it at least from a technical standpoint before you can break into the industry so for example operating systems very very basic when we talk about windows you got to know at least a little bit about powershell command line how to launch it how to use it different hotkeys Right? You can't just be clicking on stuff all the time. I mean, to be efficient at your job, you got to know the hotkeys for Windows. You got to know firewall rules. How do I configure different firewall rules? How do I get to it in Windows? Endpoint protection. How to configure different things in Windows. When we speak about group policy, registry keys, the local stuff, right, on a workstation or on a server. Like, how do you configure different GPOs? The security groups within Windows, local administrator, remote desktop users. How does that work within a Windows machine, right? 
Is it a local user? Is it a domain user? So those are some basic things when it comes to Windows that you need to understand, right? And then, Adam, you want to go over like maybe Mac and other ones that they might need to know some stuff about? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I think back for me, and not everybody needs to do it my way, but I was at the perfect age where I was, you know, 16, 17 years old when Windows 2000 was in final beta testing and release candidates before it came out. And I tinkered with it. You know, I had a PC that ran Windows 98, which was like the consumer OS. And I put Windows 2000 on it and, and like learned Windows NT and like all the specific stuff that came with that and learned about things like group policy through just tinkering with it and learned network stuff by troubleshooting my cable modem being down and how Ethernet cards work and all this sort of thing. And that's still all fundamental knowledge you still need to have to be successful in cybersecurity. And it's going to be true on other platforms too. And I think today, more than ever, I don't think you can be someone who says, well, I, I just know Windows. I don't do that Mac stuff, you know, whatever. Like, I don't think you can be that way. Because first off, the Mac is much more popular than it used to be. And certainly you are going to have, you will have people in your company who use Macs might be your executives, it might be your sales and marketing team, it might be your social media team, whomever, they will exist in your environment. And so throwing up your hands and saying, I don't know this stuff is not really okay, especially when it's built on a, on a Unix foundation anyway. It's like, if you're going to be elite hacker and <laughs> know all this stuff, then you should be able to at least jump in the terminal on a Mac OS machine and navigate through because it's just going to be standard you know, Unix, Linux commands at, at its core. And so you should understand that. And by the way, it's kind of a great way to, to get in that without like having to deal with all the rough edges of like installing your first Linux distro. Because if you can't figure out the terminal or you get stuck, you can just get rid of it, you know, quit it on the Mac and go back on with life. So it's actually a nice training wheels for, for Linux, for Unix systems, because you don't have to do anything with it, but you can. And so same thing like Andy was talking about, but on, on the Mac, like understand how the file structure works because it's totally different. You know, it, it has a Unix style. The root is just forward slash. And then all the volumes on the Mac are mounted under slash volume slash volume name. And especially now on modern Mac OSs, there's even this weird thing where the Apple file system like mounts two system drives and one is your data drive and one is the OS. And you should at least kind of have a fundamental understanding of what's going on here. How do you get to the command line? How do you set up things like Gatekeeper, which is the tool that um, prevents unsigned code from running on the Mac? Like you don't have to be a Mac expert, but you should know the Mac at this point. And again, with all that Mac knowledge, it's going to be transferable. You should at least be able to run like a basic Linux distro and get around a little bit. I'm not saying you need to have all of like the Vim <laughs> uh, commands memorized, or you need to be able to use Emacs or anything crazy like that. But you'll sh you should be able to know what sudo does or su. You should be able to know how to grep and how to pull up the processes that are running and how to kill a process and just basic stuff. Like you're just going to need to know that and have that appreciation because this knowledge, it, it's all transferable back and forth at this point where yes, there's going to be differences between the OSs, but understanding those differences makes you understand the individual operating systems better. If you can articulate that Windows does it this way, but Unix and the Mac do it that way, well, now you understand both platforms better. So being able to do that contrast and compare makes you better at all of them. So I would encourage anybody today, and, and this is coming from somebody who works at Microsoft, you need to be multiple operating system, not necessarily fluent, but familiar. I think that's really critical. Mm -hmm. Just as an example, I run Windows VMs on a Mac OS on a daily basis. That My Mac is my daily driver, and I run Windows VMs, and I RDP into Windows servers. And then today, I spent the about half the day in the terminal, uh, in command line, SSHing into Ubuntu uh, server VMs that are in our environment. And so 
all of that knowledge, I mean, you got to have a basic understanding, right? Um, one of the things that Adam mentioned was Vim. Like, you don't need to have all the commands memorized because guess what? There are Vim cheat sheets on the internet that you can just look up. I do it all the time because I don't have them memorized. But I do know the basics to Vim. When I say Vim, you should know what that means, right? It's a text editor, and you should know how to um, insert something. You should know how to write it to the file. You know how to quit it when, uh, when you bring it up because you're going to be modifying config files in the command line if you're in cybersecurity. I mean, that's just something that you do. I'm going to need to know how to do that. Or Nano, right? There's always a, a conversation online between <laughs> Vim and Nano, of course. So you need to know when I say Vim and Nano, like what does that mean, right? You need to know how to use them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Networking is another base mm -hmm. component of cybersecurity. You need to understand it. Like if you don't know what an IP address is, what IPv4 and IPv6 mean, like that's something you need to go and learn. I'm not saying you have to subnet IPv6. I can't do it, right? I'm not saying that you have to <laughs> be a subnetting expert for IPv4 even, but you need to be able to at least understand what subnets are, VLANs, you know, the TCIP and OSI models. Like you don't need to like know everything, but if I say layer three on the OSI stack, like you need to understand that because layer three is pretty common in networking, right? Layer two, what does that mean? What is a MAC address, right? Like those are basic networking terms that you need to understand. Ping, DHCP. If, if I say what DHCP is, you should understand and be able to explain what that is, right? DNS, how to configure your own DNS record. You know, we have an episode a few back about configuring your own lab. Guess what? You can get an, a Microsoft E3 dev subscription. You can go out and buy your own domain for like eight bucks a year, add that to your dev subscription, learn what it's like to onboard a domain to an email, you know, set the C name, the text records, DMARC, configure your email within a DNS record, right? If you've never done that or understand how that works, guess what? There are ways to learn how to do it, right? You got to understand firewalls like appliances. You can stand up your own home lab like using Unify or Ubiquity. The Ubiquity Edge Router is one of those really, really cheap enterprise-grade routers that are out there. And I mean, when this thing comes, it doesn't even come with its own DHCP server configured. So when you plug it in, you literally have to set the IP address of the router first, then set the IP address of your machine so that it can talk to each other on the same subnet before you can even configure anything. And that's like bare bones, right? Learn what it's like. Go out. I think the edge router is really, really inexpensive. And you can learn what it's like to configure an enterprise grade appliance from scratch. So, um, yeah, understand networking, right? It's it's baseline for being in cybersecurity. Networking is the big one, really. I mean, everything comes back to networking. I was just kind of counting in my head as we talk through the different operating systems, how many times we mentioned networking stuff. And it just, it's so common. You say it without even thinking about it because Andy would, would say things. He was talking about something on Windows and he mentioned configuring the firewall. And it's not going to make a whole lot of sense what you're doing configuring the firewall on Windows if you don't understand how networking works. So, you know, it's just all of this builds on top of each other. All of this is interrelated. And that's all that that base foundational technical knowledge you have to have. And that might influence some of your career decisions as we go through the conversation. But switching gears for a second, soft skills. Now, this is kind of a, a favorite subject of Andy and I. We talk about soft skills on the show all of the time. And that's because I think we both believe the importance of them. I mean, here we are doing a podcast where people listen to us speak, which means we have to have at least some fluency in being able to convert thoughts to words and communicate somewhat clearly. And that is one of many soft skills you're going to need to have in order to move into this business and, and any business, let's just be honest, um, being able to write a resume and avoid typos or cliches and, and being able to communicate clearly your experience to this point or make it sound as compelling as possible. That's important. 
being able to show up to an interview, you know, when we have in-person interviews again and shake somebody's hand and look at them in the eye and have a conversation. Even if you're nervous, it's okay to be nervous, but can you sell yourself? Can you articulate your knowledge? Can you succinctly demonstrate the experience and skills you've built to that point? That's a skill. And then once you move into the job, you know, you got the job, you're hired, congratulations. There's so many soft skills involved in every single day. Is it, can you write well? You need to be a good writer. Writing is such a valuable skill in modern enterprise in general, because so much is in email, so much is in IM. If you can write well, it will bode well for you. And then even like selling, being able to sell stuff. It's not just for people like me who are in technical sales, but you're selling internally all the time. Hey, we need to get this new thing. We need to get a CASB or we need to change endpoint protection platforms, being able to go to the powers that be who write the checks and control the purse strings and sell them on why we need to do this is super important. Yes, you can bring in the vendor to help sell them on it and they will gladly do that, but there's internal selling too. I think back to my time in enterprise IT, there were multiple projects where we were internally selling the need to get this tool or to do this thing or to switch this platform. So that's another thing that jumps out to me as super important. What did I miss soft skills wise, Andy? Or what else do we need to mention? I think about my workflow on a daily basis, right? Just being able to keep track of what I have to do and who I need to respond to. I think it's super important, you know, just being able to organize your thoughts and get your work done. I don't leave any email unanswered by the end of the day. If someone messages me on an IM, I try to respond within a timely fashion. If there's a request for something in security that is required for, say, a project manager, I try to get that done in a timely fashion because they're on a deadline and you don't want to get a reputation that, oh, security is the bottleneck in all of these different projects and um, they're holding everyone up, right? And there's different skills that you need to bring to the table depending on who you're talking to. If you're talking to a project manager or someone else in IT, you communicate in a different way than if I were to be talking to my boss, a CISO or the CEO or anyone on the executive board, I may go very, very deep on a topic with a coworker, but when I'm presenting to someone in, on the executive level, they don't have time to listen to me ramble about some technical aspect of why this needs to be done. They just need to understand the risk and what I need to do to fix it. And if they want to ask follow-up questions, certainly you can, but you know, you got to be able to mold yourself in the moment. Um, and I think also it's really important to think outside the box. That's one of the things that I think frustrates me with a lot of folks who are thinking about getting into cybersecurity because you got to be able to find solutions on your own. You can't always ask somebody what the answer is because when it comes down to it, you're the person who's responsible for it. So you got to be able to do your own research. You got to have that Google foo, you know, that we talk about, like you got to be able to find answers on the internet, right? You got the whole World Wide web at your fingertips. There's a lot of forums. There's a lot of documentation. There's probably someone out there who has encountered the same situation you have. So being able to think outside the box and research the solution, because that's what you are, your problem solver, right? Like you're finding solutions, whether it's finding a solution to protect your company or finding a solution when you're under attack and you got to stop the attack or, you know, finding out what happened, what was taken or what was breached and then finding a solution so that it'll never happen again, right? Like you're a problem solver. And so you got to be able to do that on your own. And if you're not the type of person who's comfortable in researching and, and being curious and continually working and f thinking outside the box and be able to work under pressure, then this might not be the career field for you, right? You know, what's so interesting as I was thinking through all the things you're laying out and all the things I laid out, those are all skills that first off kids, 
pay attention in your writing classes in school, take your public speaking class in school seriously. They're, they're teaching you valuable skills that you can take with you if you want to learn them. So uh, by all means, that business writing class they make you take in college, actually super valuable. That, that presentation class, super valuable. Um, but even if you're not going to like formal education or higher education, it doesn't mean you can't learn these things. If you if you kind of blew off writing because you didn't like it in school and now you realize you need to brush up on it, hey, there's this fantastic resource that's free in your community. It's called a library. <laughs> and you could go get books on how to write better, how to be a better presenter. You can join a club like Toastmasters to learn how to be a better public speaker. There are so many resources to brush up on these skills. And if you're already in enterprise IT, maybe doing a different role, just make it a goal, practice. I'm gonna communicate better. I'm going to um, try to persuade somebody through building a presentation that I'm going to deliver to them, or I'm going to uh, work on improving my communication skills by, by writing my emails more clearly or something. Obviously, you want your goals to be measurable, but there's so many different ways you can get better, practice, improve, and develop these skills that you're all going to need moving forward. So uh, Andy and I love soft skills, and we'll, we'll probably never stop hammering them on the show, but there's the good news is there's always ways to get better at all of these things. And there's tons of people and tons of resources to help you. And most of them don't cost a thing. Yeah. And soft skills too. Guess what? You gain friends, right? The, the nicer you are and the, the better that you're able to communicate, you're going to network better with people in this industry. And I can't tell you how important that is. Um, there's a lot of communities out there. There's a lot of discords for people who are in, mentoring positions if you're looking for a mentor but make sure that you work on this because networking is one of the most important and when i say networking i mean with people is one of the most important things in this community as an example there was an exchange vulnerability a few weeks ago you might have heard about it i was one of the first people to find out about it in my company because i had a friend Adam Brewer, who messaged me right when it came out, when it was released from Microsoft. He said, hey, Andy, here's something that's hot off the press. You might want to know about this. And guess what? I did. So, you know, have those contacts that are communicating with you. Um, it's so important. And be teachable, mm -hmm. you know. I tell people that I can teach anyone to be in cybersecurity if you are eager and willing to learn. But I can't make you want to love this job like you have to want to be here and you want to be able to retain that information that people tell you right i'm always amazed that i run into people through my travels in it and andy you're a tech enthusiast and and i'm a tech enthusiast like i i do technology stuff for fun um we've had this interesting discussion in a uh conversation we have with some former colleagues from Microsoft actually um, geeking out over ways to bring video content in in a car on a road trip. And it's been fun seeing like us come up with all these crazy solutions to do it. Raspberry Pi this, NVIDIA Shield that, uh, mobile router this. It's It's been funny to, to see, but it just shows that we're tech enthusiasts all of the time. And I, I don't feel comfortable telling somebody like, if you don't want to do this job, even when you're not getting paid, it's not for you. Like get paid for stuff that's work related. I'm, I'm not saying otherwise, by all means, burnout is a huge problem and you should be on the clock when you're doing work. But I think it's really hard to be really successful in this business. If like, you're the kind of guy who wants to guy or gal, sorry. Um, that wants to punch the clock at five o'clock and then go sit in the woods all weekend and not touch technology like ever anytime you're off the clock. I don't think this is the business for you. And, and I don't mean to be exclusionary because believe me, we need more people in cybersecurity. We especially need more diversity in cybersecurity. And I'm all in on that. But 
at a fundamental level, there has to be that like that thirst, that hunger, that desire to learn and tinker and experiment with it. You you have to be the kid that liked to take things apart when you were younger and figure out how they worked. Like that's that's that insatiable curiosity is such an important part of this. And I was talking about, you know, when I was a kid in high school, I was screwing around with, you know, Windows 2000 Professional on my like Dell because I wanted to know how it worked because I'd heard about this thing, Windows NT, and I never touched it before. And I wanted to see what made it tick. Why was it different than Windows 98? Why were people worried about driver incompatibility and it's not going to run Diablo 2 or whatever at the time? <laughs> um, but that was just curiosity. And, and I'm not saying you have to do it my way, but certainly it's, it's, there's an important aspect to that, I think, to Andy's point, that you have to want to learn it. You have to want to be part of it. And to Adam's point, too, I don't think it's important that you do this all the time, right? Like, you got to no, have some no. variety in your life. I think you will definitely burn out if you are just focused on work, 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 and, and learning about this stuff. Have a balance, right? I do other things outside of technology, but at the same time, like Adam's saying, I have this interest that technology is always going to be a part of my life, whether I work in the industry or not. So experience is something. But think about that, that example with, with like the, the mobile routers and the cars and the Raspberry Pi. It's like Raspberry Pi, you're, you're doing stuff in a, in a Linux environment and you're, you're learning about ARM CPUs and you're learning about data transfer and you're configuring this like really micro local area wireless network. And that's not, you're not like doing, you know, cybersecurity at that moment. You're just building something for fun so your kids can watch, you know, the latest episode of Paw Patrol. But at the same time, you're still like advancing those skills that you will use in your day job. And that was kind of my point is, again, not that I want you to do that all of the time, but that has to be at least somewhat of an interest, I think. I, I don't think it's something you can turn off and only do 40 hours a week. Yeah. Yeah, and that kind of rolls into like our conversation about like experience, right? Because I think in this industry, nothing trumps experience. Like you want to get to the point where your experience on a job interview speaks for itself. But the problem is, is that there's this vicious cycle, right? You need experience to get jobs and then you need a job to get experience. And so if you're in that cycle where you're just starting off and every single job, and this is a fault of our industry in HR, but you know, every job is asking for like five years of experience in like an entry level position. You know, if, if you're in that cycle where you haven't gotten that job, that first job and you don't have any experience, well, there are other ways to demonstrate your competence in cybersecurity, write a blog or have a GitHub account where you're doing things there or participate in capture the flags or bug bounties. There are platforms like Hack the Box or Try Hack Me where you can walk through that training and it's legitimate in the industry if you get, you know, the particular puzzles that are solved in those platforms, that counts as experience, right? Think about a job interview in this mobile video platform that Adam and I are talking about, right? How do I get video content to my kids on a road trip? Well, if I... If I had zero experience in the industry, I could say, well, I worked on a project recently where I did this. I imaged a Raspberry Pi with this particular distro. I set up my own local wireless LAN in the car. And then I have a Samba share that has a bunch of movies that my kids connected to via their iPads. I mean, it's it, you're setting up content delivery with wireless networking, right? With an OS. I mean, it's all the things that we're talking about, right? And that counts. If you can explain that in a job interview, and this is just something basic. Like I did this on the weekend for fun after we were talking about it. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. I mean, Raspberry Pi was $30, right? SD card and, and you're good to go. Um, there are other platforms like Microsoft Learning. There's tons of free training out there on all the Microsoft platforms. There's another one that we may do a podcast on called Range Force. They have a community edition that's free and it's very, very cybersecurity focused training that goes through like 
this is what Splunk is. They have virtual machines that you can spin up Splunk instances and go through logs and incident response and Windows logs, stuff like that. There's another platform called Let's Defend where it kind of sets up your own little sock and it gives you little alerts that you can do investigations on. And I'll put all these links in our show notes, but just know that there's training out there to give you the experience if you don't have it at a company yet. I love the example of, of talking about that home project and that would blow somebody away in most interviews. If you can articulate that you did this, that, and this, and how you put all the pieces together, that could be your interview right there because there's so much you can talk about. Like, well, how did you learn to do this? Well, I was looking across the blogs and I got pointed to this FAQ and I did this and then it broke and I tried that. Like, man, that's awesome right there. And it's, um, it's, it, the, oh, I know what the other thing I was going to say is I was like stumbling over my words here. Don't be afraid sometimes just to get your foot in the door too, because to everything we talked about, we talk about like, you need all this base level experience. You need all of this base level knowledge, this technical knowledge, you need all of these soft skills. And, and like Andy said, nothing trumps experience. So sometimes it might just be hard for a cybersecurity job to be a first job because the stakes are high. That's okay. There's plenty of other things you can go do in IT and all of them, every aspect of the job is going to build skills. You need to work towards that cybersecurity role that you want to do next. And if it's for the company that, you know, is a great employer in your town and you know, they have a really good IT shop, like just get your foot in the door, just go do something. I mean, it could be help desk. Like don't be dismissive of help desk. Help desk is hard and you get to touch everything when you're in help desk. It's a great place to start learning. That's why so many people do. But if you're going to go and help desk, make sure there's a career path because the one challenge with that, and I don't want to get way off on a tangent here, is that most companies outsource it and you are working for a outsourcing company that doesn't have a career path because you are on contract and that is your only job. And there's no way, easy way for you to kind of map back to the company you are contracting for um, to move up in their org. So don't get boxed out there. I've seen too many good, good, talented people get stuck in the help desk loop because they're working for a a staffing firm instead of actually the employer where they want to be at. So that's, that's one caveat, but by all means, just get your foot in the door and it's going to build all these skills you need. Just keep your eye on the prize and make sure everyone knows you you can loudly communicate it, that this is where I want to get to. And they're going to help you get there because the subject has come up on the show all the time. I mean, Tanya Jenka mentioned it most recently when we did her podcast on application security. There is such a talent gap that if somebody is raising their hand and saying, hey, I want to get in you know, cybersecurity, I, help me get there, everyone's going to help you get there because we all need you to get there. And so again, just get started. Just start somewhere and just work towards it. You'll get there. Um, people are not going to be throwing up blockers to prevent you from getting into that business, believe me, because we need all the help we can get. Yeah, you're speaking of interviews, and I just wanted to kind of tell the story to people because, you know, it's important. We talk about these soft skills all the time, and I'm just going to drive this point home one more time. My interview for Microsoft, it was a very grueling day. I think it was probably four or five hours, hour-long interviews were panels, one of the questions came up was how would I explain office to someone who is non-technical? And the example that I used was essentially being able to explain office to my mom who is not technical, right? I used a personal example in my life that I do all the time, explain tech to my friends and family who are non-technical. And those skills translate in technical selling, you know, or in an industry where you need to be have those soft skills, right? You need to be able to communicate complicated issues at a very basic level so people understand. And so, um, and that answer got me the job. That was my hiring manager and I answered it and he was blown away by my answer and that, <laughs> that got me the job. So, you know, those things that you do on your side, on the side, in your personal life will absolutely translate to things that you can communicate during an interview, like these little side projects, and they may get you that job. 
So let's talk about certifications for a second, because people have a lot of opinions on certifications. Again, I, I just brought up Tanya, and we had Tanya on a couple of weeks ago. She were, she was pretty dismissive of them. You know, thought they were kind of a money making industry in a lot of ways, and they kind of are. Um, but at the same time, of course, it is a way to differentiate yourself. So it is, it, it's a double edged sword. They they cost too much money. Um, it is. It, as somebody who holds, like I hold certified ethical hacker, um, I don't know if I'm a great ethical hacker by any means. I don't know if I'm going to be doing any pen testing tomorrow. I know there's more certs to do that, but I did it. I passed it and I'm proud of it because it was hard, but I don't know how much it demonstrates necessarily. And so it's one of the things where it's going to help. It's going to help separate you for sure. But I don't know, like if, if you like, I, I want to get my first cybersecurity job, I'm going to go get my CISSP. Like, I don't know if that's necessary. I don't know if that's even going to help you necessarily. Um, because then it almost looks like, you, you know, you put too much effort into that as opposed to all the foundational stuff. Andy and I keep talking about like soft skills and base technical skills where we'd rather see you put your effort in for your first cybersecurity role. So, I'm torn on exactly what advice to give. You know, I suppose something like the CompTIA Security Plus would not be a bad place to start. Um, but I, I don't know. Andy, I'm curious to get your take on it. I, I, I'm not giving really clear guidance here to our uh, listeners. And I think that's because it's a complicated answer. Some people love certs. They're going to be like, go get, go get a cert. You need a cert. You must have a cert. And some people are going to say certs are garbage. Who cares? Nobody cares. Show me your experience. Tell me what you've actually done. I could care less that you, you know, memorized a bunch of answers and paid way too much money to go take a test and get some letters after your name. So you will get both answers if you ask people. I think the real answer is it depends, right? It, <laughs> and, and I can't, uh, you know, I know that that's not the answer that probably you want to hear and what Adam, you wanted me to kind of say, but you know, if you have zero experience and your resume doesn't pop, right. And you're lacking in some of the other areas, a cert is going to help you stand out. It's going to, it's going to float your resume to the top. It's going to, you know, check the box, right? That a recruiter may reach out to you and then you'll get a chance to interview. Um, however, if you're able to articulate in your resume or in the interview, your experience and your knowledge, you may not need a cert to get hired. You know, I don't have my CISSP. Um, I do have other cert certifications and I have advanced degrees in cybersecurity, but I don't have that, you know, gold standard of cybersecurity cert in the industry. And so, you know, my resume generally has my experience. And then when I go in an interview, I'm able to talk about my experience. I listened to another podcast that is by the guy who stopped uh, one of the, uh, I think it was not Petya, there was a domain that he registered um, and, uh, you know, he's a malware analysis engineer, reverse engineer um, person who lives in the UK. And, you know, he was talking about his experience. And when he interviewed for the job, he didn't have any certs. He doesn't even have a degree. And he just talks about his experience and his knowledge and that got him the position. So if you're able to do that, you know, it, it depends, right? But if you don't have any experience in, you're not very good at writing resumes and you, you can't fill out all the things that you need to A cert will help you stand out. And so get one because I think you'll need something. And even later on, it's just, you know, something to put next to your name, but uh, it's not absolutely necessary. If you do want an inexpensive one to go grab, Microsoft is, and, and I try not to plug stuff for my company too much, but I will here because I think it's a good, value. Uh, we are rolling out new security and compliance focused exams. And we just announced four of them at the Ignite conference a couple weeks ago. And one of them is like a pretty high level. It's the SC 900. And it is a relatively straightforward exam that kind of shows overall knowledge of kind of basically all the security stuff that's in Microsoft 365. So, you know, kind of putting all the pieces together here, you could go get your developer tenant 
that Andy and I talked about that's free, that's an E5 tenant. You can kind of learn where all the buttons and switches are and kind of what all the things do and poke at them a little bit. Maybe buy the measure up test, which is, you know, relatively cheap. And I think for, you know, under 200 bucks, you can at least have a, a kind of fundamentals Microsoft security certification. And it's not going to take you that much time. And it's something that, you know, again, like Andy said, if you just need a little, a little pop on your resume, that's going to be a relatively straightforward one to get and complete. Um, and it's not going to require like hours and hours of study or anything like that. And it's not going to cost like a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks or anything crazy like that. Literally, I think most people that are listening to the show could go pass that exam in a, in a relatively straightforward manner. So that's, that's one option too. If you just want something that's, um, relatively inexpensive and relatively uh, few hours needed to invest in it to to be um, able to complete it. So let's move on to some other things I think are important in the industry. There are a lot of tools that you should be familiar with. I'm not saying that you need to be an expert on them, but you should know what they are, what they do, and how they work. So just kind of going off a list like Nmap, Wireshark. Wireshark is super important. Know how to do a PCAP capture and know how to at least do the basics in reading it, right? How to find the domains, the DNS entries, the IP addresses, you know, search for that. If you are proficient at Wireshark, that in itself can probably get you a job. I mean, there are people whose job literally is to parse PCAPs. And if you're good at it and you learn it, that could be the difference maker. Um, some other ones like Metasploit and Burp Suite, you know, you don't have to be experts on it. If you're on a red team, you're going to use those, right? But even if you're on a blue team, you should understand what they are, how they work, and what they're used for. FileZilla, WinSCP, you know, those are basic tools that you use if you're a Linux user, right? If you're using Linux machines and you need to copy things over port 22, um, Windows Sys internals, you know, there's some great tools out there. Process Explorer, Auto Runs, those are tools that are used during uh, forensics investigations. PS Exec, that is a tool that a lot of white hats, black hats use. I mean, it's a very powerful tool. Have a virtual lab. You know, we mentioned that we had an episode on it. You know, spin up some VMs, virtual boxes, know how to configure your own servers and how to do that spin up your own distro for linux they're free download it spin it up right incident response tools have like a list or you know i i carry around a usb i still have it from when i worked at the help desk at my old company where it has all of my incident response tools that i used for malware scanning rootkit scanning url reputation lookups osint sites that I would go to to find, you know, incident response things. So be familiar with the tools. And if you're, if you need help, you know, I'm certain that there's people in the industry who will give you that on Twitter itself. You know, there's people who are like, here's a list of all the OSINT URLs that I go to, or, you know, Shodan and all that other stuff. So, um, you know, have that tool set, your, your toolbox, so to speak, and be familiar with it. Get ready to memorize all the Nmap flags if you want to certify the ethical hacker. Yeah. Um, but in all seriousness, the sys internals tools alone, like you, you just got to know them. You just got to be familiar with them. You don't have to know everything, but know there is a tool that does this thing. Because that way, when you're trying to do something, you go, oh, you know, light bulb goes off. Let's go get uh, PS Exec or Proc uh, Explorer to go, go look at things. Um, as long as you know they're there, you, they can help you. And, you know, kind of moving right along is, is kind of things you need to know. Andy did a great job summarizing tools. You're going to, and even if you're going to be like a Mac guy or a Linux guy, you need to at least understand the Active Directory from a fundamental level because it's just, it's, it's everywhere. It is ubiquitous. And understand the basics of it. I am not an Active Directory expert. I work for Microsoft. I sell Azure Active Directory. I am not an Active Directory expert. 
just to be super candid, super honest. People are like, hey, you know, somebody wants to get really deep in this, and and I go, uh, okay, I don't, I don't really go there. We had uh, Morgan Patswold on was one of our first guests on this show, and we did a deep dive in Active Directory kind of configuration and hardening, and that was mostly over my head. So just to be fair, like I, I'm just trying to make everyone comfortable here. That is a tool that there are people who go 900 levels deep. You do not need to go there, but you should be able to articulate like, what's the difference between enterprise admin and domain admin? How do permissions work? What the heck is Kerberos and, and how does it work? Uh, domain join and device management and device identity. Shannon Fritz talked about that on the show. Uh, group policy, how does that get applied and how does that relate to AD? Um, how to secure it, how to break it. There's a ton of stuff here, but just know the fundamentals, know the pieces, because everything comes back to identity, everything comes back to AD um, in, in so many different cases. And so knowing the fundamentals, just it's critical to being successful. And then moving on into like more modern times, you know, Adam, you mentioned Azure Active Directory. I think it's really important to have some fundamental understanding of how the cloud platforms work. You know, there's three major ones out there. I, I honestly, I think it's mostly two, AWS and Azure, although Google Cloud is, is in there. But, you know, majority of companies use either Azure or AWS. And so you should have a fundamental understanding of those. And both of those, guess what? Both Azure and AWS, I'm not sure about Google Cloud, but they both include developer tenants that you can go and play with and you can understand know have a good understanding of at least one of them because the skill sets that you get from one will translate to another one right like global admin is a term that's used in azure but they don't use global admin in aws they call it the root user right so that's the most important root uh, user in aws and then they use um, accounts instead of um like workspaces subscriptions or subscriptions right so there's a, yeah. it, it kind of it kind of there are parodies between the two but if you understand one you, like if you know how subscriptions and workspaces work in azure you it's basically kind of like accounts in aws and right and then the permissions behind that right there are identity and roles permissions versus access to the the resources and so all that knowledge transfers back and forth. So have a basic understanding of the cloud. Yeah, nothing to add there other than just to poke at it, get those developer tenants and, and understand how it works. What's it look like to spin up a VM? How does that actually work? What are some of the other tools out there? Again, like you don't need to know everything, but understand what's available. Like what's the difference between a network security group in Azure versus like Azure Firewall? When do you use one versus the other? And, and you know, you don't need to go any deeper than that, but just know what pieces are out there. Um, coding. I personally was forced to take a coding class in college. I was a MIS major, which was mostly computer science dropouts. I was kind of the exception in that I was MIS from the get-go. I am so glad they made me take a coding class. I had to take a coding class. Um, it was Java when I took it. So this is, you know, probably like uh, 14 years ago or so. But just knowing how to write Java and really basic apps in Java and how objects work and everything else in it, I can read most code and kind of stumble through it. Like I am not an expert by any means, but you can show me some code and I can probably at least surmise what it's trying to do. And that's from one coding class. And again, I'm not saying you need to go to your local university and sign up for their computer science 101 class. But what I am saying is getting any experience in any sort of like object oriented programming or scripting language is going to help you because so many of the concepts are transferable. And again, just because I learned Java, I can read most other stuff and I'm not an expert in it, but I have an, I have a good enough idea of what it's doing to know if it's malicious or if it's helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Python's a really good one for information security professionals. If you're, if you're looking for a language to kind of be a little bit more proficient in, 
Obviously, PowerShell, I think, is super important in enterprise. Everyone uses Windows servers, so, you know, understand PowerShell and how that works. And then our last topic that I think is also really, really important. Um, you know, we kind of mentioned a little bit about the current events that are going on, but, man, it is so important in cybersecurity to stay up on current events because this industry is fast-paced and there is stuff happening all the time. I think it would be terrible if my boss came to me and said, hey, you know, hey, Andy, did you hear about that exchange thing that happened two weeks ago? And I had no idea that it happened. Or if they came to me now and said, hey, did you hear about that solar winds thing that happened? Oh, by the way, we use solar winds. You know, what was that all about? And if I had no idea that that was happening, you know, that would be a failure in my part as a cybersecurity professional trying to protect my company. So I think just staying up on current events, staying in touch with people who are in the industry, they're able to communicate with you the things that are going on, um, I think is baseline important. And that could be the difference too in an interview where you're sitting down and, you know, if there was anyone interviewing last week, yeah, it, I would be like, hey, I wonder, are you guys doing stuff with Exchange right now? You know, that could be your hint into the interviewer to say, hey, I'm I'm staying up with current events. I know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Just another another differentiator. If you have that ability to uh, know the sources to go to and stay up on them and manage all your responsibilities, because yes, we all have day jobs. And I think of there's this cartoon that makes the rounds on LinkedIn on a semi regular basis. And it's a bunch of cavemen who are trying to push a cart with like square wheels or triangle wheels on it. And this guy's coming up with the with the wheel like the circular wheel. And they they kind of push him off and say, No, thanks, we're too busy. Like I'm trying to show you the wheel here, this is going to make your life better. But you're so focused on on in the weeds and what you're doing right now, you're not seeing ways that it might make your job easier or are just really, really, really important developments in the broader space. Because if you were neck deep in something else and you didn't come up for air and know about the exchange server thing, and that was a scenario where that was being actively exploited. So literally every minute of delay was increasing risk for your organization. That's harmful. And so there has to be that balance of obviously staying focused and not letting every little ping be like Doug in the movie up where it's squirrel, you know, but still balancing that knowing what's going on and being able to react to it in a timely fashion. Very important. Yeah. Even thinking back to the solar winds breach, that was another friend of mine who just happens to also work for Microsoft. He sent me a, a link to a Twitter account for a journalist and that sent me down the rabbit hole, and that was 6.30 a.m. in the morning. And the news had just broken kind of over the weekend, but it wasn't really bad until that Monday morning. And because of that, I was one of the first people to post in my company about the SolarWinds thing. And my boss didn't even realize that we had SolarWinds in the company because we had gotten it through a, an acquisition. So we weren't aware that we were actually using it, and I had only known about it because... I was networking within my company and I talked to the network manager and he mentioned that this other acquisition had solar wind. So I kind of was like, Oh, I think we use it. I wonder how widely used it is. And you know, if you know anything about solar winds, it's used, it's widely used. So, <laughs> um, so I mean, you know, all these skill sets, right. They all make a difference and staying up on current events is so important in the industry. So have, you know, Twitter, have Reddit, you know, bleeping computers, some RSS feeds, you know, those are important to have a way to organize that so that you get the most current news that's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just want to say two things before we wrap up the show. Number one, I, I do just want to say on the record that I was not made aware of the exchange um uh, zero days until they were already publicly disclosed. So I did not disclose anything to Andy that was not already public. I just want that on the record. Um, <laughs> second thing I, I just want to say, kind of summarizing our whole conversation to this point is 
you might listen to this podcast and say, dang, that was an hour of stuff that I need to all go do. And that's intimidating and impossible. And we're kind of really breaking it down at a, at a pretty micro level. But the thing is, good cybersecurity practitioners, they just do this stuff naturally. It comes natural to them. If all of this sounds artificial to you, then yeah, that would be really hard. But if you've got the right makeup for this job, a lot of this over time, I'm not saying it will be day one, but a lot of this will come natural to you too. It is a natural balancing act of focus, uh, staying up with current events, managing soft skills, managing technical skills, focusing on specific areas of interest, but not losing your skills as a generalist. Like there's a lot here, but it's less challenging than it sounds. We're not trying to make it hard. We're not trying to make it scary. We just want to be complete in the conversation, but also acknowledge that not everybody will be good at all of this, and that's fine. I'm definitely not. And you don't have to do this all at once. You will develop these skills over time naturally if you're a good fit for this or, uh, for this um, type of role. Well, this was a little bit longer than normal for our episodes, but I think this was a important conversation for those who are trying to get into the industry because we need more people and, and skilled people. So thanks for listening to this. That was our episode for this week. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have recommendations for topics that you want to hear about or have follow-up questions about the episode, just reach out to us. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.